I put together this quick highlight reel of all the interviews I've had the great fortune to be able to do with world-class saxophone players. It's like 10 minutes of saxophone gems for you. Hey there, I hope you're doing fantastic. I just wanna say thank you so much for supporting the Better Sax channel over the years as we approach another milestone of 300,000 subscribers. Other than subscribing and liking the videos and just watching, the best way to support the channel is to go visit bettersax.com and check out all the fantastic courses we have for sale over there. Now, enjoy this. I know you're going to love it, especially the last one. <laughs> If you play Cherokee or uh, back the knife through all the keys, you get probably every possible interval. It all amounts to you being able to hear whatever you needed to play, technically, without not even thinking about it, you know? And if you miss it, that's okay. A big influence on my organ playing was saxophone players. Right. That's where I when I came on a scene, of course I loved Jimmy Smith and, and all the cats, right? And I was close to all of them. My lines were coming out of like, you know, uh, Sonny Rollins and, and John Coltrane. And I always adored the sound of Gene Ammons, you know, that sound, you know. Mm. I mean, we all loved, and Charles Lloyd I loved too. It's a different thing, man, but yeah. it's so sweet. And all that was in here. So I kind of had some sort of idea of what I wanted to sound like. Yeah. If you go out there trying to play what you played the night before, you will fail every time. Right. You have to listen. Right. You have to be a little bit more open. I mean, there's the thing about the language with whatever type of jazz, you know, if it's straight ahead, or trad jazz, um, funk, whatever, bebop. There's a lot of stuff that's the language of that genre, subgenre. But if you're not in tune to just being an open individual, you're not really playing the music. Saxophone players in general don't use enough air. That's across the board. So when I play alto and tenor around my teachers, I'm with air that I would use for baritone. For them, that's just the correct amount of air. How do you make that sound? I'm like, I could try to explain to you, but like, I, I think you should try to make your own sound. Spend, spend 20 minutes every day, like, not playing notes, playing any type of crazy sound and, and, and trying new stuff, because if you only practice what people teach you, you only learn what they know. <laughs> But going into the studio is like a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing now, you know, more than ever now, I'm trying to record, I have a Zoom and I'm trying to record my every performance. I tell my students um, to record their practice routines. Can you imagine waking up every day and not knowing what you were putting on, not knowing what you were wearing, and just going out every day wearing that? And then one day, <laughs> someone puts a mirror in your place with the saxophone or, or with just with music. It's important to listen to yourself and see where you are. You know, where, where, how's my intonation? How's, you know, am I getting the sound that I want? You know, is it as bright as I think it is? Is it, is it as dark as I think it is? Because if you're not recording you know, you're, you might be steering in a direction that's not really where you want to go. People think, uh, I don't want them to tongue, and then they're like, oh, Mr. Gajol, I, I came to your gig the other night and you were tonguing like crazy. Yeah, but I'm telling you not to tongue right now so that when you, when you finally get this together, you know, you come in with the lightest tongue known to man. I mean, all the stuff the train played, he wasn't articulating that. It's impossible. So, you know, you help them to understand that the, the, the tongue is a crutch if you're trying to play intervallic things or things that are after the scale, you know. Would you rather be a drummer that 
can swing and chooses not to, or a drummer that can't swing and chooses not to. That's it, for me, that's everything. It's like, you do this work, you, you acquire a lot of ability and skills and stuff, not so that you use them all, but so that you have choices. You, you know, in fact, you never want to use them all. I never want to be like, uh, you know, maybe like a, like a half a percentage of my performance time do I ever want to feel like I'm in using the full toolbox. But it's nice to know, you know, that things are there if and when I need them. You really think of it as an ear training exercise and it helps to get all the intervals locked in and to hear. This is a very slow process for me in the beginning of I had so many ideas up here and I couldn't get them onto my horn. So slowing it way down, working on it for like five minutes a day and then getting your ear training together so that you can get here to here. But the truth is all this stuff that I do to learn this stuff, like if you knew what was actually going on in my head when I'm playing something like this, you might think like like so I you know, am I thinking oh D minor and then the A and then and then pop and then and then this little sixteenth note rhythm? Heck no! You want to know what I'm thinking when I'm doing that? I'm thinking, okay, okay, breathe, okay. This, this chair is a little uncomfortable. Okay, oh, I'm sliding my face in the camera. Okay, open your oh, no, don't open your eyes. That is what I'm thinking when I'm playing. So does that mean that I have this, you know, this amazing innate musical ability and music just flows from my fingertips without any effort? That's what it sounds like, right? Heck no, it means the exact opposite of that. Because, and, and, and here's another thing before I go on. This sounds like it's super arrogant, but it's the opposite of that. What I just played there is, it was extremely easy for me. Extremely easy. But the only reason I can say that is because I wasn't thinking about anything and because I practiced this stuff so painfully slow for such a painfully long period of time that I have to play that. Anybody could play what I'm playing if they spent the time that I did working on. Our job is to just build vocabulary. Mm build quotes, build references. It's the same as your verbal language. Like you want to have a memory palace that you can just draw from and then give back to the audience. A lot of people don't even think about that right. aspect. You know, I went to Berklee College of Music. I got my degree. It's the best contemporary music school in the world. They didn't teach me, you know, kind of how to be on stage or how to perform. And I get it. They taught me everything else, you know. But at a certain point, all of us that graduated together, we make a living playing music live. That's how most of us make our living. So why not try and teach those concepts? And I eventually wrote a book called How to Play Madison Square Garden. And it's not a music business book. It's not a, you know, how to play your instrument or how to navigate the music business. It's how to figure out how to build who you are on stage. And I think that's something that most people just don't e even think about. They, that they're all into their instrument and their music, but how would that, you know, how do you convey that to an audience and make them want to buy a ticket for your next show? The beautiful thing is every key has another house of harmony, which is a flatted fifth away from that. And that is interesting because every key is missing five notes. And so where are these five notes? How do you find them? They're chromatic notes. Oh, if you look at the key of C and the key of G flat, or F sharp, you know, whatever you want to think of it, the notes that are not in C are all found there. If you look at the key of F, where are those missing notes? They're in the key of B. If you look at B flat, those notes are in the key of E. So then I thought it was like there are two houses that kind of live next door to each other. And imagine if you and I live next door and you have the same lamp as I have. And you have the same living room table, the same dining room set. We have the same sets of dishes. The only thing is mine is orange and yours is green. The music is bigger than us. We should always do our best. And if someone's better than me today, well, I'll try to get better. And if I can never be as good as them, who cares? Don't care. The only thing I can do is be the best Eric. That's it.
But in an academic environment, the easiest thing to teach is the sort of mathematical stuff, the, the harmony, the harmony stuff. That's you can put that on a on a blackboard and talk about it and 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 it all makes sense and it's really not that different from teaching math. The thing about this music is that it's something that has to come from your body and your and your spirit. That those, those are not really, you know, typical academic subjects. I have so many memories of uh, students coming to me and and the focus of the lesson is speed. You know, they they want to know how do, how can I play fast? And um, you know, unlike almost anything else related to the saxophone, that lesson tends to be really short because, <laughs> because yeah, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, the answers to that question are like the things that we all don't want to hear, but we all know. And so essentially, um, I, I, I think the way to get fast is to get to the get to the point with your with, with your technique where it's as though your fingers um, are glued to the pearls. I hope you have just even a fraction of the joy that I've had playing the saxophone. I wish that for you in your life. Wait, just a fraction? It will be a lot, by the way. Oh, okay then.